Bonsoir, good evening. I'm excited to be here. And uh, I hope you're not too exhausted from being shot to the moon too often. <laughs> I'll go vertical with you now again, so <laughs> you have no choice. Introducing vertical farming is often a tough job because either people haven't heard about it or they have these images buzzing around in, these, uh, in the internet about these fantastic buildings. But they are not real, not yet. I will tell you what is real about vertical farming. First of all, we will have fresh, safe food, less resources we will use, and less food miles, and that's, in short, what vertical farming can deliver to us. I just came back from a trip to Beijing, uh, attending the summit, uh, the Vertical Farming Summit there, and uh, Beijing is just a buzzing, densely populated megacity with now 20 million inhabitants, with all the characteristics we know about a densely populated megacity. Uh, bad air, traffic jams, a very strong income uh, gap between poor and rich, very rich people in, in Beijing, and unsafe food. China is scattered with food scandals. And we all know by now that these megacities, and Beijing will be a 100 million megacity, super megacity, in about 10 years by the year 2025. 20, Unbelievable. And we know by now that today's cities are unsustainable. And when I left China, I took a day flight, a, a window seat, because I wanted to see what I crossed and what I have left. And I have been to China since more than 30 years. So I have an image about it, what has changed. And looking down briefly after we left Beijing, we were crossing mountain areas, and soon the vast desert stretched hours for hours under me. And from 10,000 meters above, I could see the vast and empty beauty of China's landscape. And it was visible to me what, what we have talked about during the Vertical Farming Summit the past two days. And China is just an extreme example for that. It, it is showing all the challenges, the world challenges we are facing. And that's the world, that's the world population growth. We will have till 2050 a world population of about 10 million. We will we are facing negative effects of agriculture. For, first of all, the pesticides, the agricultural runoff, the ocean acidification. But we also have to face, and China is facing this in the Northwest extremely, depleting fresh water resources. The challenge is 70% of this is used in agriculture. You might know these figures. And then food transport. We are carrying food from all over, the, from one end to, uh, of the world to the other, often 4,000 miles, approximately 1.5 thousand kilometers is a salad uh, transported from the origin uh, to the consumer. So this adds to greenhouse gas emissions and food waste, because we lose food on these transporting ways. And on top of this, I mean, that's already enough, on top of this, we have to face the consequences of rapid climate change. And that means that erosion, sandstorms, droughts, and floods are endangering every year the yields and the incomes of farmers. So farmers leave their homes and leave their families behind. Feeding the world? No, we haven't solved this problem. 
not at all. It's a distribution problem, but it's an unseen imbalance. We have 870 million people go to bed hungry, and we have, what's more obscene, 1.5 million people overweight. And we need, actually now, for the 7 billion people we have, we lead the, the landmass of South America to feed them. And as I just told you, another 3 million will come, billion will come, sorry. <laughs> 3 million would be nice. 3 billion. And for this, we need an additional landmass of the size of Brazil, what we don't have. So what to do? People always dreamt about this land, this utopia, this land of abundant food, which is just reachable without work, just flying into your mouth. We can see this in many, in many fairy tales, even in the Bible, in the land of milk and honey. And I will, I will take you today on a journey to these utopian or this fantasy which is coming much closer to us than ever in human history. And vertical farming will be one pillar of this. And to make it more, more visible and, and more feelable for you, I would ask you just to lean back, take a breath, relax, as I do now, <laughs> and, and close your eyes and imagine living in your most desired environment. And don't see anybody closing the eyes and imagine this. <laughs> Try to do it. Take a breath because relaxation always enhancing your creativity and your awareness. So closing your eyes and thinking of this place, maybe on a beach with a glass of red wine, watching the sunset, being with your friends, or just reading a book, or, uh, or having your most favorite food. And if you have visualized this very deeply, maybe just briefly, but deeply, but then I hope you feel more happy, more inspired. And that's exactly, if you come back now here to this room, then that's exactly what we do or what we offer plants in a controlled environment agriculture setting. That's the heart of vertical farming. So what's a controlled environment agriculture? It's the perfect setting for a plant to grow. We give them the right temperature, humidity, the gas composition, the light spectrum, which is very important for a plant to grow, the light intensity, the duration of illumination, and sure, water. The watering method differs, the temperature, and the nutrients, nutrients which are in this water in, included already. So these plant recipes are researched by modern plant science intensively. And each of these plants, like you and you and me, have different needs. And that's what we provide plants in a controlled environment agriculture. What other techniques do we need? First of all, LEDs. That's what makes vertical farming soon and already commercially viable, because LEDs are energy efficient and they have a, big, uh, a very big uh, advantage of other kind of lightning. They give one certain wavelength, a spectrum which preferably is used uh, by plants for photosynthesis, mainly in the blue and in the red spectrum, as you can see here. What do we get if we use this technology? We have up to 
98% less water. This is real resource efficient. And 60% less fertilizer. And all this is in scarcity in the world. What else do we gain? A two to three times faster grow, grow rate, a higher vitamin and mineral content, intense taste, and reliable yields. That's what open agriculture doesn't have and doesn't provide. And this higher nutrient content could be a very important part of fighting against malnutrition and nutritional deficits. Because all these vitamins can be individually mastered with a, in, within a plant. The future of agriculture is growing soilless. That means we are independent. We are independent whether it's arable land or it's in the garage. We don't need the soil because it's done with hydroponic systems, as you can see here or here, or the aeroponic systems. This is a hydroponic system. The water is just flooding through these uh, plastic channels or an aeroponic system where the water nutrient solution is sprayed around the roots. So the roots have a very easy access to their food. So annual production capacity in a controlled environment um, agriculture system stacked like here vertically can have 150 times higher output than a greenhouse, which is already intense. That means that, that each indoor farming hectare equals 10 hectares outdoor. That's a big advantage because we don't have more arable land left. So how and where and in which way can we uh, implement uh, vertical farming? For example, on a rooftop, like it's done already in Brooklyn in, in the United States, uh, mainly on, on rooftops, but we can also uh, do it with a very interesting economically viable system, the hydronic, hydro, hydraulic vertical farm, as we see it in Singapore. I've just visited there. It's, it's a really very efficient system, which is only applicable in, in, the, in the tropic areas, but it is, um, the, the vegetables and the plants are provided to supermarkets there already. Or we can do it indoor, like the Japanese do it, in so-called plant factories. They have 190 uh, plant factories already installed. After Fukushima, they had no other choice. Or we can put it in our home. You just open it like a fridge and cut off your microgreens or your salad, which is, I think, uh, the, the, the most comfortable way to have it. Or we can put it in a container for disaster areas, for immediate help. There are very, very many different uh, models to, to do it. Or we can put it in space on Moon and Mars. I guess you have been waiting for that because it's a moonshot idea. <laughs> and it's true. It was developed by NASA 15 years ago to enable us to live in space on Moon and Mars. So it's a real moonshot idea. And it has the power, it has the technology, it has the potential to help our planet to stay green and blue. And it's really up to us. We have the technology, we have the knowledge, we are independent from season and from the region and the climate, doing agriculture in a very sustainable way. And it's up to us to implement it now, to start now. And as Moliere, I think it was a very fitting quote, said, it's not only for what we do that we are held responsible, but also for what we do not do. And that's why I'm engaged in vertical farming. Thank you.